Three minutes after ten is the time. A very good morning indeed to you. It happens to all hacks eventually, I think. It's a sign of age and it's a sign of uh, creaking bones, metaphorically speaking, as you begin to get thirsty for good news. I wish there was some good news we could talk about today. So I just caught myself then in the news bulletin thinking, shall we introduce a daily search for one good news story a day, something we can all celebrate? Because Simon mentioned the fact that monkeypox seems to have plateaued. And that seems to me to be a rather beautiful distillation of the state of the nation. The best news in Britain today is that monkeypox seems to have plateaued. Uh, in other words, a number of people contracting monkeypox one of the most innocuously named uh, diseases in the history of diseases, monkeypox. It sounds almost like a breakfast cereal, but it's monkeypox has plateaued. It means that people are that the number of people getting it seems to have steadied, seems to have levelled out. And then I found myself thinking, if that really is the only good news story in the country today, maybe your idea of having a new feature to identify the best good news story of the day is doomed before it has even begun. Uh, And I am currently leaning towards that conclusion. Doomed before it has even begun. Speaking of the state of the nation, I've got an international, I've got one of our United Nations shows coming down the pipeline. I can feel it. I I don't know when we'll do it. I don't know how we'll do it. I don't know exactly what we'll do with it. But I do think that we need to just get a flavour of what, what, what life feels like elsewhere because I don't like the idea of us being in particular peril of of the situation in this country when you look at the inflation figures published today, when you look at job vacancies, when you look at cost of living, energy prices. I, I, I would derive some comfort, odd though that may sound, from the thought that every other country or most other countries were Um, suffering similarly. There are few more depressing words in the English language than the words you just heard in the news bulletin there. Cabinet Minister Kit Malthouse. Good grief. Has it really come to this? But don't forget, just around the corner now, you're going to be hearing the words Prime Minister Liz Truss. So I'd take a win if you offered it to me on on Cabinet Minister Kit Malthouse. (sighs) Unbelievable. But I'm trying again this morning to uh, blame everything on the war in Ukraine and uh, sundry other issues without ever mentioning the Brexit that they have inflicted upon this undeserving nation for reasons that they are too stupid ever to understand or explain. Quite incredible to reflect upon that. So, six minutes after ten is the time. We'll begin with Liz Truss and, and we'll begin with... We'll begin with Mark, actually, who's already texted in to say, this kind of nonsense from t- Truss plays really well with my family. I've missed the word out from that sentence. Can you guess what that word is? Hi, James. That kind of nonsense from trust plays really well with my family. No, not that word. Don't be ridiculous. It's only 10 o'clock in the morning. We're not effing and jeffing yet, even on texts. Uh, They feel isolated from the comment because they're Tories and will agree that everyone else is lazy. So she's not talking about them personally. Yes, you're right. The, The missing word from the first sentence was Tory. And I did, oddly see in that text a a, a fairly accurate reflection of my own thoughts on this. Just before I open my gob towards the end of Nick's show, I had a little echo of the post-Brexit refrain that we heard so often on the programme from people whose own family had essentially voted to chuck them out of the country. I didn't mean you. And it is such a weapon for the right wing, probably for the left wing as well, but they haven't been in power for 12 years and my memory's not what it used to be. Oh, I didn't mean you. Oh, we've got to get rid of those immigrants. Oh, I'm, hello, I'm your doctor. I'm an immigrant. Oh, I didn't mean you. We've got to get rid of those immigrants. We've got to get rid of those Polish people or those Romanians. Oh, hello, I'm your, I'm your builder. I'm your gynecologist. I'm your accountant and I happen to be Polish. Oh, I didn't mean you. Got to get rid of those Romanians. Oh, hello, I'm your daughter's best friend's mum from primary school. I'm Romanian. Oh, I didn't mean you. We've got to get rid of those foreigners. Got to get rid of those Germans. Oh, hello, I'm your, I'm your son-in-law. Oh, I didn't mean you. Heard it all the time on the programme. There's something in that that needs further development, needs further exploration, I think. That idea of othering even when they're not others. It's so successful. I guess it reaches its apotheosis in that despicable poster that Farage unveiled shortly before a white supremacist terrorist murdered Joe Cox. That, that idea of turning other humans into a threat, even though you know nothing about them and you don't know them at all, turning them into a negative, painting other people 
in abusive, insulting terms, securing the knowledge that none of the people that you're performing for are going to get close enough to them to find out that you're lying. Because here's the thing about Liz Truss, we are not idle. We are not an idle nation. We have low productivity for a variety of reasons, which we will hope to explore today. But chiefly, I believe, because British companies have been freed up since the 1980s to extract as much short-term profit from their coffers as possible, whereas productivity is improved by investment in infrastructure, workforce, and practices, equipment, everything. I, I mean, it's a simplistic analysis, but it's got to be part of the problem, hasn't it? You look at why other countries have higher profits for shareholders, but higher productivity from workers. It's about speculating to accumulate. Invest today, make more money tomorrow. But if you're just desperate to rip out as much money as you can today, which again is at the ideological heart of this uh, particular brand of conservatism, it has been since 1979, deregulation is exactly what... Um, I'm describing get more money out more money and they claim it's an incentive for investment but it's not really it's an incentive for asset stripping and then they wonder why productivity is low because British workforces are using uh, old equipment or, 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 or old premises did you see the story about the hospital roofs yesterday 34 I think hospital roofs are, are in danger of imminently falling in and that sits very neatly alongside the I don't know if you can call this news because it was so bleeding obvious from day one that Boris Johnson's promised 40 hospitals are about as likely to happen as Kidder Mr Harry is winning the FA Cup this season never say never Keith never say never so 10 minutes after 10 is the time have a listen to this um, reflect upon the fact that if you've been lucky enough to listen to this program over the last few years, you will be the least surprised people in the country because I have been telling you for the best part of a decade what these people are made of and with particular reference to Liz Truss and their ludicrous, ludicrous book written in conjunction with Quasi Kwarteng, Pretty Patel, Chris Skidmore and, 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 and another one. Who's the other one? Who's it? Truss, Skidmore, Kwarteng, Rob, of course, Dominic Rob. That's Keith's first ever political contribution to the programme. He's only been here two and a half years. Well played, Keith. Lovely worked. 11 minutes after 10 is the time. You will be among the least surprised people in the country because I've been telling you for the best part of a decade what these people are made of. And crucially, I've been telling you what they think of you. And this is the bit I don't get. And this is why Mark's text is so pertinent. And this is why I couldn't help thinking of the, oh, I didn't mean you line used after Brexit by people who'd voted to uh, uh, diminish the existence of their own friends and family. I didn't mean you. Who does she mean? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. And where would someone like Liz Truss, whose working career before politics, as far as I can tell, involved being an accountant at the super profitable multinationals Shell and uh, Cable and Wireless... Where, where does this idea come from? How does this get seeded in the mind of someone like Liz Truss? Is, is she um, in hoc to the secretly funded think tanks, so-called think tanks, that are popping up all over the place to uh, represent the interests of their anonymous donors without ever admitting either that they are popping up all over the place solely to represent the interests of their anonymous donors or indeed disclosing the identity of their donors? But they'll be along in a minute with a Daily Telegraph column and a little slot on the BBC News. Is that all it is? I mean, has the Conservative Party been successfully infiltrated by the ghouls and vampires of Tufton Street? I don't know. But where does she get that idea from? Anyway, have a little listen to what Liz Truss thinks about you and your daughter and your dad. Basically, British, British workers. I once wrote a book about this, which got mischaracterized. But British workers um, produce less per hour than... And that's a combination of kind of skill and application. Essentially, it's partly a sort of mindset and attitude thing, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's working culture, basically. If you go to China, it's quite different, I can assure you. But there's a fundamental issue of British working culture. And essentially, if we're going to be a richer country and a more prosperous country, that needs to change. But I don't think people are that keen to change that. There's a slight thing in Britain about wanting the easy answers. In the referendum, it's like, who say it's all Europe that's causing all these problems, it's all these migrants that are causing these problems, and actually what needs to happen is, you know, a bit more uh, 
the more graft. <laughs> and it's, it's not a popular message. I'm but that's astonishing on so many levels. It's astonishing because she's been hiding in plain sight since she published that ridiculous book. It's astonishing because she actually dismantles the whole motivation behind Brexit, for example, the, the utterly bogus and dishonest demonization of migrants. It shows that she knows, which is terrifying. I would rather have a vampire in charge that knows they're, that doesn't realize they're a vampire than a vampire who knows they're a vampire but is pretending not to be. I mean, that line there about the migrants in many ways could get us another hour of radio. We do an hour on the comments about graft and hard work and an hour on the tacit admission there that the entire Conservative government is currently built upon lies about migration and migrants. Inevitably, the front page of the Daily Telegraph today returns to that territory. What would you do? What would you do if you were in charge of this country? And you were absolutely terrified of your party faithful just finally waking up one morning and realising that you're in charge of this country. Modern slavery law is biggest loophole for migrants. I, to be honest with you, that pathetic headline from the Daily Telegraph today, that pathetic front page, yeah, well, it looks, it, it, it looks like the Watergate-era Washington Post when you compare it to the Daily Mail. Thinking of today, the, the cost of living, the inflation, the energy prices... There's a, a, a massive crisis looming in the NHS. The ambulance service is about to buckle. What does the Daily Mail splash with? Some absolute hogwash from Grant Shapps about the possibility of putting number plates on bicycles. There are mornings, aren't there, where we feel like a failed state. It's incredible. But thank goodness Liz Truss is going to be Prime Minister because she really holds the British people in high regard. Oh. What, 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 I, I think some mornings we can just chat, can't we? So... I would say this as, as question number one. What do you think of that? And what, what has that done to you? Hearing that after the shift you put in last week, what, what has that done to you? 0345 6060 973. And include the comments about Europe and migrants as well. The, the admission from Liz Truss. The, the ice queen of Brexit vying to become Boris Johnson Mark II. The admission in private when she didn't realise the comments would be made public that blaming bad stuff on Europe and on migrants is dishonest, bogus and daft. That's incredible, right? I've done that thing again where I've changed, changed, changed tack on a topic halfway through my introduction. Drag myself back to the first point of interest. Who's she talking about? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. How do you feel knowing that your next prime minister thinks that you lack the work ethic? How does that make you feel? And if you are like Mark's Tory family, any chance of a quick call? Just the, just the idea that yes, she's absolutely right. It doesn't mean me. It means those people over there, the up peasants, pe yeah, lazy peasants. Or, of course, there's a slim possibility that she's just thinking about that time Jacob Rees-Mogg had a kip on the front bench of the House of Commons. I mean, if that was your uh, experience of, of working culture, you could be forgiven for thinking that the population lacked a work ethic. Anyone else had a snooze at work? With such contempt for the British public that you didn't even care there were cameras present? I don't know. OK, here we go. 0345 6060973. Uh, a, a nice entry level question for you first. Well, what did that, what are those comments? The bit about China, particularly galling, I felt. Oh, we need to be more like communist China, where workers are like drones with, with few rights and no dignity and no respect. Yes, we need to be more like that, says the next prime minister. 0345 6060973. -06 and, and where does she get this idea from? I'd, I'd love you to have a crack at that. What does productivity mean? And why is it so low in this country? Because I'll tell you something for nothing. It is not because you are lazy. 19 minutes after 10. And well, let's start in Scotland. Uh, Liz Truss was there yesterday promising to uh, provide more scrutiny of the Scottish government, which is not remotely arrogant, patronising or breathtaking at all. Brian's in Aberdeen. Brian, what would you like to say? Uh, I just... I. I love it when politicians speak about uh, productivity when they clearly rarely have any real idea what it means. I mean, Liz Truss's comments really, I think, demonstrate just how ignorant uh, and 
well, just stupid and wrong she is on this it, issue. Isn't it, isn't it more subtle than that? I mean, listen, I'm not, I can't criticise other people for using words like ignorant and stupid. I've, I've allowed them to be introduced to my political vocabulary in the last couple of years for, for reasons that are blindingly obvious. But, but it can't just be that she's being stupid. There must be something subtler going on. Something has led her to this place. When she sat down with Dominic Raab and Kwasi Kwarteng, and the rest of them to actually write a book and they all agreed to contain the line among the idolists in the world. It's come from somewhere. They haven't all miraculously and coincidentally arrived at the conclusion that British workers are lazy. They believe it, even though they don't really know any. Uh, yeah, because they are stupid and ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> I just gave you the easiest way to step back from that position and you just went in with both feet, studs up. Didn't you? <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> Well, yeah, I'll explain because, you know, there, there's productivity, okay? I mean, it's if you want to increase productivity, then there are two things you can do. The two things that make the biggest difference. Yes. One is investment. Yes. And two is elimination of waste. Um, and this is this is something I've worked in for some years, so I, I, I will... Yeah. Modestly suggest I. Um, you know no what you're talking about. about. Yeah, it'll so, never catch on. You, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, not in the Tory party anyway. Um, but if you if you take a very simple example, if you've got two farmers, one of them chooses to invest in a tractor, the other chooses to continue ploughing his field with a, a horse-drawn plough. Mm. Well, it doesn't matter how many tea breaks either farmer takes the guy with the tractor is always going to have a more productive farm. And you can apply... But the, the guy with the plough has given the money that he would have spent on the tractor to his investors, you see. Um, well, yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Basically, I took your analogy you can, and I gave it a bit of a polish there, Brian, you see? That's quite nice. Yeah, I, I like that. Yeah, well done, works. James. Thank you, Brian, yeah. thank you. Um, <laughs> but you can apply the same thinking. You, you, you can scale that up. Let's say you've got uh, products that you want to get from like Birmingham to Central Europe. Well, you can, you know, an easy way to do that would be to load your products onto a, a high capacity, high speed train line that links directly all the way through the European network. Mm. Or you can continue to rely on B roads and rail infrastructure that was built in the Victorian era. And hey, why not erect some absolutely unnecessary new trade barriers? Uh, while you're at it well, as well. Yeah, that's also true. You put up trade barriers, you know, and Brexit is a form of putting up Let's trade abolish barriers. frictionless so trade. Let's abolish frictionless trade with the largest market in the world. That'd be cool. That would be good for productivity. Yeah. So all of those things, I mean, it's it's government investment as well as private business investment. Government need to invest in the infrastructure, which they've conspicuously not done and actually reduced it. And if she's going to cut taxes, she is going to have to cut spending as well, of course. So that is less investment in infrastructure. Exactly. So you take all of that investment away. Well, you know, okay, British workers could, if they wanted, choose to take loads and loads of tea breaks. Mm. But that's really inconsequential. It's not going to make the blindest bit of difference because they've still got a horse-drawn plough. Brian, I, I, I'm going to withdraw my invitation to you to uh, step back from the words ignorant and stupid because I, I, I issued it without listening to your full analysis. And now that I have listened to your full analysis, yeah, that works. It is just ignorant and stupid, although ignorant is a, is a more nuanced word than some people allow. And I'm interested in the roots of the ignorance. And I might even pompously reach for the phrase the ideological roots of this ignorance how does somebody like Liz Truss and Dominic Raab and Kwasi Kwarteng and uh, Priti Patel and Chris Skidmore how do they end up at the conclusion that British workers are lazy when they don't know any British workers that's a genuine question that I invite you to answer Michael's in thank you Brian take care Michael's in Ludlow Michael what would you like to say lovely part of the world uh, good morning Brian hello um, Brian so, sorry um yes I'm a welder, um, work in a factory. Um, Whereabouts? Done... In the black Sorry, country? In Ludlow. In Ludlow? Yes. Gosh. Yes, this is, um, it used to be a small family-run firm. It's been bought out by Americans. Okay. Um, a few years ago, we make agricultural machinery. Um, I'm a welder fabricator. Yeah. I qualified as a welder 31 years ago. Um, it's... 
was considered a skilled trade then. I was earning as much as my friends who trained as um, electricians, plumbers, um, stuff like that. So I was on a what I considered a good wage when I started welding yes. in 1991. When I took this job two and a half years ago, I said to the manager who interviewed me, um, when he explained... Just, I'm sorry, Mike, I'm going to have to hurry you up a bit. I don't know if you're doing something else while you're talking to me, like making a sandwich or a bit of light welding, but I'm just going to nudge you towards the point you rang in to make. OK, uh, no, Please. sorry, I work nights. Yeah, um, that's all right. Everybody in the factory, including myself, have actually turned around and gone, we don't care about producing any parts. Right. Our pay rise was 56 or 5.6 percent this year and what sort of profits are the company our making manager, sorry what sort of profits oh, they're is making the... millions yeah there it is um our manager um operation director in our company gave himself a 28 percent rise and the and the foot soldiers are, are, are getting scraps from the table yeah and, and, and that... i am basically getting the same hourly rate as i got when i was first qualified as a skilled worker and that will be a common experience you know, can i ask you a slightly I... unexpected question Yes. Well, what do you think about the railway strikes? I think they're great. Oh, I, okay. The problem with our company is the people are so disillusioned and so poorly paid. We have got such poor union membership now, and I've been a union member all my life. The, well, the unions have been castrated, haven't they? Yeah, basically, we have got absolutely no say. But the th- this is why she wants. Run, this is why she wants to be more like China. You see, more like China. If you if you yeah. do, if you don't uh, tug your forelock, off your cap, say thank you for the pittance that you're paid, and then work yourself yes. into an early grave, then it'll be the labour camps for you, my friend. Oh, absolutely! That's incredible that uh, she said that bit out loud. We need to be more like China. I think that goes back to Brian, ignorant and stupid. Um, mate, get some kip. <laughs> yeah, 10 hours shift coming up. All right, you look after uh, yourself. No, I'm going to crack on. going to get some other calls on. 27 minutes after 10 is the time. James is in Tilbury. James, what would you like to say? Uh, very, uh, yeah, very good morning. I uh, represent British seafarers. Um, and listening to your show this morning, one thing I'd like to say to Liz Truss. Yes. Um, we work endless hours, nights. We spend a long time away from our families in order to keep the supply lines open, uh, bringing in all sorts of goods from uh, China, Europe, America. Yeah. It's a very difficult job. We can be working um, up to 20 hours a day. Um, and, you know, she, she needs to, to realise that there's hard-working people within the shipping industry, um, you know, working all hours under the sun to keep the trade lines uh, tr- uh, trade open for Britain and her comments today were disgusting. I'm glad you used that word because I completely agree with you but it, it has much more power coming from, from you. Can I ask what you are or where you were politically over, over the last decade or, or would that be too rude of me? I, I, I've, I've been in the shipping industry for the last 20 years uh, working uh, all sorts of coastal routes uh, bringing in... Uh, Politi- I said politically uh, not professionally. Where does your politics traditionally lie James? Um, my politics lie um, not with the Tories. Okay. It used to lie, used to lie with the Tories. Yes, that's what um, I was wondering. But, but not anymore. I not didn't know this. The... I, I, I mean, whether it was true or not, as I was growing up, and I don't know how old you are, when, but when I was growing up, they liked to cast themselves as the party of the work of, of hard work. You know, the parties of aspiration, the party of business. Yes. And now you've got one Prime Minister on the way out who famously said "f business" when he was trying to push Brexit through, and another one on the way in who thinks we're all. As lazy as Jacob Rees-Mogg, which is incredibly insulting. It is. And one point I'd like to make is in the seafaring industry and in the shipping industry, we have relied um, on um, having open trade and open borders and free movement of people. And we are seeing huge effects. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, no, you're not. Nothing to do with Brexit. It's all because (laughs) of um, it's all it's all because of the don't blame it on the Brexit. Blame it on the boogie. Didn't you get the memo? (laughs) It's nothing to do with Brexit. It's all to do with the boogie. I gratefully disagree with that. <laughs> Take care, James. Thank you for everything that you do. Don't blame it on the sunshine. Don't blame it on the moonlight. Don't blame it on the Brexit. Blame it on the boogie. It's half past ten. Dominic Ellis has your headlines. I, 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 it's the politics of it as well. I, I, you remember when Gordon Brown was recorded calling uh, that woman a bigot, which was technically, I suppose, 
defensible, but was politically and optically absolutely awful. She was one of those people who'd been persuaded that her problems or her community's problems were caused by migrants, which, as Liz Truss concedes in this uh, uh, recording, is not true. It's, that's the, actually, that's the most amazing bit. You need to back up a bit, don't you? She's actually saying it's just not true. We, we blame all our problems on Europe and migrants, but it's not true. That was in 2019 as well, long after she'd undertaken her U-turn on Brexit. But in private, she's still perfectly capable of denigrating the two biggest platforms upon which Brexit was built. The, 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 the lies, the bogus representations of immigration in general and the European Union in particular. <coughs> So the politics of it intrigues me. This, this question of uh, Andrew Mitchell's career was over, wasn't it? When he called a police officer a pleb. Allegedly. Is it allegedly or not? I think it was, I mean, either way. You, 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 that was it. He was out of the cabinet. A different era, I grant you. David Cameron was prime minister. I saw them once at a party, you know, and, and Andrew Mitchell called David Cameron prime minister, even though he wasn't prime minister anymore. I asked a couple of political hacks present whether or not that was normal behavior. Apparently not. Just a little bit of an anecdote for you there. You can take the boy out of the gossip columns. So calling a police officer a pleb, career curtains or, or cabinet curtains, if you like, just normal ones, not Lulu little ones, which are currently festering in the back of a removal van. And Gordon Brown, electoral disaster when he was recorded calling a woman a bigot. Liz Truss is recorded calling pretty much everybody in Britain lazy. Why doesn't it land anymore? Why doesn't it matter? 0345 6060973. Oh, oh, and I think the grown-ups need to know what productivity is. Or rather, the, the rest of us need the grown-ups to tell us what productivity really is. Brian in Aberdeen, very strong on explaining the ignorance behind her comments. I'm prepared to give her a bit more benefit of the doubt at this point. Is there uh, any mileage in the idea that Britain's historically low productivity is linked to the work ethic of British workers? Because uh, maybe I'm being a bit naive and patriotic in springing to the defence of, of the workforce when the woman who is about to become Prime Minister is quite happy in private to attack it. 0345 6060973. Oh, and I'm going to do this possibly later in the programme with regard to Rwanda, but I do I do keep coming back to Mark's text. That kind of nonsense from trust plays really well with my Tory family. Have you got relatives who like this? I'm working on the principle that if you like this, the days of you thinking you could ring in and, and um, land a punch are over. And, and that's a shame. I really miss you. But, you know, you can set up an anonymous Twitter account with a bulldog avatar and, and, and tweet about how stupid I am and how we vet callers and we'll never let anyone as clever as you on the program. Because it's a shame you don't ring in anymore. But maybe your wife will ring in or, or, your, or, your, or, your, or your children will ring in and tell us what you're like and tell us the arguments you make in, 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 in company with them that you've somehow no longer got the... Uh, courage to try to make on the radio. 0345 6060973 is the number that you need. Charlie's in Lewis. Charlie, what do you think? What do I think? Gosh, where to start, James? I think I'm a first time caller for number one. So well I'll done. See Carry how on. this goes. Thank you. <laughs> um, so when she, when she talks about lazy workers and the others do, I, I think this is a case of ideology over observable reality, yes. I think is what's going on. And I think it, it kind of matches quite well with your 1984 quote you like to quite often. So they, they, they seem to have a sense of how things work or how economics work. And I don't know if they studied the E of PPE when they were at uh, Oxbridge, yeah. but there seems to be a sense of. They just resort to these stereotypes because it fits in with an ideology. So think in particular about productivity to try and follow up that last excellent yes. call. When I, when I think about observable reality, what most affects productivity is literally, for number one, how much time does a worker get to spend at work? So what I mean by that is if you have to spend days off sick because you can't get a, a hospital appointment, or it takes ages to get to work or between appointments because road and rail infrastructure is buggered, or you can't get promotion because the education system let you down, yes. or you take time off to look after your parents. All of these things point to observable reality that if you could spend more time at work, what would boost that would be state expenditure on the health service, on transport, on education, on social care. People would be able to spend so much more time at work and know they were cared and looked after that that would clearly be the biggest single boost productivity that's sad. I mean, it seems as it of, seems as obvious as the nose on your face that to me and to most does, people I, listening i don't know if that's taught in the e of ppe because i wasn't smart enough to study that i just did marketing well, I, I, no, I, well, 
I think there's a lack of humanity in the analysis as well, isn't there? I, mean, I don't know whether it's a bit lazy or unfair to suggest that this speaks to me of someone who doesn't like people. I mean, she feels yeah. that people are either an inconvenience or, a, or a, you know, or she thinks they're lazy and stupid, but that's okay because they'll vote for her. There, there, there's no yeah. recognition of what you describe. And the comparison with China should be chilling. The idea that we, oh, we, can, get, we can increase productivity by becoming a totalitarian state. <laughs> Which is it's not a very attractive idea, to be honest with you. Not to me. Although we seem, seem to be heading that way. But I think you're right. I, it's almost like maybe one of the downsides, and I don't want to misjudge everybody, you know, the Oxbridge education, the route that she's gone, is you, you're not sufficiently exposed to, let's not say real people, but enough people who are experiencing how life Yes, really? so but, they, the but the I... real people vote for her. This is the great mystery for me of modern politics. Well, it's well, the history sure. of life is that, that, that people sure. are voting for her, even as she calls them lazy, because she think they think that she's not talking about them. I think. Listen, I think you're right. But clearly, when it's like amplified and amplified by a very supportive client journalist, as you say, mm. it's a very hard thing to kind of counter. But when you, it's it's so easy though to if you can take one step back. And look at each of the things that so. both candidates are saying. Yes. I just want to add one other thing, if I yep, could. In briefly, my, quickly. I may not ever call you again, I don't know. The, um, oh, I hope she talks about boost, Yeah, she talks about boosting growth. But again, the reality is that since the Second World War, growth has grown in a rough Just sense watch, your langu- watch your language a little bit, Charlie. Please. I'm so I'm, sorry. That's right, we uh, dumped it anyway. So, so, so back up a little bit. What annoys people? Okay. So I think what annoys people possibly the most, possibly unconsciously, is that you know that it doesn't matter how hard you work, you're not going to share in growth. Well, that, was, that takes us back to our friend in Ludlow with, with a, with a four, 4 or 5% pay rise when management are getting 28%. I even write that down to get the numbers right. Charlie, thank you. Next time, watch the potty mouth. I look forward to your second appearance on the programme. 10.40 is the time. Uh, 20 to 11 in old money. 0345 6060. 973 is the number you need. And again, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm, I'm extending a, a, an olive branch here because I, I think that they must think more, that they must have more to go on than what we think they've got to go on. Do you, do you see what I mean? So Brian and now Charlie both offering up analyses of productivity that seem to me to be irresistible. So how can people with good educations, don't know, that education is necessarily a mark of intelligence, but with good educations end up believing that British workers are lazy and that productivity is a result of idleness. 0345 606 is the number that you need. That's the bit that is intriguing to me. And if it was a throwaway comment from one politician, then maybe it wouldn't feel so significant. But it's not. It's, 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 it's part of her marrow. It's part of her political marrow. So much so that she wrote that infernal book, 150-odd pages, five authors, 150. That sounds pretty idle to me. Even I managed to get a couple of books out on my own. Five authors. Uh, but then they wrote those immortal words about British workers being among the idolist in the world. It runs through her, this belief, like Blackpool through a stick of rock, and I want to know where it comes from. 0345 6060973. Should we do Id- Idiot's Corner on the text? Idiot's Corner on the text? Does James not consider the inflected, infected blood payments to be a good news story, or could it be he's friends with the idiot that is Ken Clark. Yeah, okay, you carry on, mate. Stay away from scissors. Rob's in Maidstone. Rob, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Well, I, I have a, one of those families who will be voting for Liz Trust and think she walks on water. Um, <sighs> now I've my commiserations. Times, my commiserations, Rob. Yes, but I've phoned a couple of times over the last year about mental health and the financial crisis and all those things because that's what my lived experience was. I remember. And in and out. Yeah, I've been in and out of hospital four or five times. My sister put into a letter to a member of my family that Rob is lazy, indolent, and must get off his ass Because the only way to get better is to be working. Now, she is not a bad person, but those views have come straight from her political stuff. Because she believes in what she's been told by yeah. all of her Tory friends. And it's quite sad. <laughs> well, it, 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 I mean, it, there's a lot going on there, Rob. First of all, yeah. I am, I am, I, I mean, I feel for you. That's a horrible situation yeah. to be put in. Second of all, I, I, I've thought about this a lot recently, the, the sort of philosophy of it. It's almost as if people who are relatively fortunate have to believe that people who are unfortunate are unfortunate through their own fault because that allows them to cling on to the idea that, that, 
A, it's not luck that has delivered their lives, and B, they're, they're not living lucky lives that could be taken away at any minute. There's a form of self-protection in that, in that outlook, I think, sometimes. And there is a psychological theory that deals exactly with that, is about that? how we acquire more. We begin to think that we have we have done more to deserve it. Yes. As opposed to we knew the right person who told us about a job, or Mark, our company did better because it had a something parents that sent you to, Parents sent you to a certain school, certain or, school, or you yeah. Had other advantages yeah. and privileges, and, and and all of that. And yeah. I, wow, what would what I mean? I, what would your sister's reasoning be? Do you think where would she fit in on that model? If if that's not an she intrusive will, question, she will, no, she will tell you that, yeah. that because she went back to school when she became, when when she got divorced and then yeah. became an accountant and then made money and bought a house and you know then met another. she would say because of that she it was her hard work yeah. that got her out of the situation and would not acknowledge that she had support from family you know think because once she'd achieved it it was because of what she had done yes not because of a situation or, or the world once, turning what yeah. what i get that and I, a lot of people will be in similar situations although yeah. poss- possibly not with the contrast quite as stark as it is with you and how does she derive I mean, it's easier to answer the next bit, actually. I was about to say, how, how does she go along with what Truss has said? And the answer is because she's supremely confident that Liz Truss isn't talking about her. She's talking about you. Exactly. Oh, Ooh, dear. But, but don't worry. I, I wanted some good news, though, James. Yes? Since we've been talking, um, finished treatment, back in the job market. Oh, well done, mate. And, and doing much better. Great stuff. I'm glad to hear so it, Rob. Hope for all those people out there. Yes, all right, mate? N- no, there is. And you take care. Keep in touch. I look forward to when you won't be able to ring me because you'll be, you'll be too busy in, a, in, in, your new, in your new livelihood. A little bit more good news, if it counts as such, from Andrew Sentence, the uh, um, former member of the Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England. House price inflation is actually down. That's down to 7.8%. Um, so uh, if, it's still about four times the 2% target. But that means that the... Um, in one key area, inflation is coming down, even as it is driven upwards by the cost of food and fuel and other commodities. Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three commodities. I play this game called Spelling Bee that the New York Times does every day. You pay a couple of quid a month to do it. it. Comes off the back of Wordle, and sometimes on the radio I say a word, and I realise that it was one of the answers on Spelling Bee a couple of days ago that I missed. Bloody commodity! It's ten forty five. 10.48 is the time. Um, how can Liz Truss go out into the world selling Britain now? Asks Steve. Who's going to invest in this lazy workforce that she describes? It's a, an extremely good point. Um, and British workers do an estimated £30 billion worth of unpaid work per year. Um, productivity is not <laughs> what Liz Truss thinks it is, which is fairly remarkable. I'm going to pick over the bones of that clip again in a minute and also remind you of... Uh, well, another journalist who brought, because I tend not to get very close to these people these days, but another journalist who brought that book to her attention, and she threw Dominic Raab under a bus, which is looking increasingly dishonest and disingenuous now that we've heard evidence of her essentially echoing exactly the same thoughts in a private meeting. Uh, Gordon's in Weldon. Gordon, what would you like to say? Well, I was um, pondering what's been said, yes. and... Um, I think we, I think, I think we are lazier than people in China, but but absolutely rightly so. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know that lazier is the right word, but I know what you mean. We, we possibly, no, no, we're not working having, at the end having, of a whip. <laughs> exactly that. Having spent a lot of my twenties um, and thirties in, in in Asia, yes, you've got millions of people starving. You've got people that can barely barely feed themselves. So it's understandable they're going to work around the clock. And I wouldn't wish that on anyone in the UK if we can avoid it at all. Uh, well, and, and that, I, I'm sure when I say that, don't I, and then there's a tiny little voice in the back of my head going, really, really, James, really? I'm sure that they don't want to return to a form of serfdom or, or feudalism where essentially you have to work uh, uh, until you drop, otherwise you won't be able to eat that night. But it, it's, it's a very odd position for a British politician to take in the 21st century, isn't it? It, it, it's, it's literally it's Darwinian in, in Asia, a lot, the way that people have to work round the clock to feed themselves and look after themselves. It's even worse when you go to the rural areas. The, 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 the extreme poverty is unreal. Do you think, she, do you think she to hates... To suggest we want to head in that direction is bonkers. Uh, well, you know that and I know that. 
some people yeah. like the sound of it. Rob's sister probably likes the sound of it because that's the only way that these lazy bums are going to get off their backsides and actually do a proper shift. It does, is there a degree of contempt here? Do, do you think she hates people? Uh, I just don't think she's joined the dots. No. Um, uh, there's, you know, you, you 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 go to somewhere like China. If you go to a hospital, you have to pay before you're treated, mm. albeit well, not very that. much. But they won't touch you. No, they'd love that. I think you know, this lot. There's there's very little benefit if you if you're not working. There's no support network. So a lot of the things that we enjoy in the UK that then ultimately drive productivity, but probably make make the government. Um, spend more money don't don't exist and you you would think actually you know a a communist country where there's something for everyone would actually have a better support network and structure but the reality is the opposite of course many ways human nature intervenes in the uh in the in the modeling doesn't it every time briefly politically how old are you gordon if you don't mind me asking i'm 46 46 so Similar vintage to me. I'm just four years older than you. Am I going a bit nuts, or would this have really blown up a candidacy a few years ago, this sort of comment coming to the fore? I think it would have got people in a lot of trouble, yeah, a lot I more do. than it, it has Liz. I, I wonder um, whether... I'm, I'm old enough Go on. to remember when Gordon Brown got in hot water for yes. calling someone a bigot. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, this, this is probably worse, because you're really? calling everyone. Because she's actually... She's insulting us. Not, not just one woman in... in, in, in one media round, all of us. Um, 10.52 is the time. Thank you, Gordon. Anthony's in Bletchley Park. Anthony, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Good morning. Um, I've got a question which sort of kind of reverses the Liz Truss situation, which is now she's been caught saying this, how is she going to, how are they going to unsay it? Saying now what? Saying the thing that she said? Yeah. I mean, let's have a, let's just late. remind people, because people might just be tuning in. Let's, do, let's, do you want to be my co-presenter today? Do you want to be, should we do this together? Uh, love to. Uh, carry on. So here is what Anthony is referring to. Let's just on your idea of changing the economic orthodoxy. You have talked that about wrong. this. That's me. That's my, the Anthony. It's your first shift, and you've blown it. Oh, sorry. That's, I resigned immediately. I'm that, lazy. That's not the one that I wanted. That's that's the other one. <laughs> I shall, well, I'll come back to that in a minute. You ca- you carry on. That was my bad, by the way. It wasn't yours or anybody else's. It was me being too clever for my own good again. Carry on, Anthony. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, now she's called us apparently lazy. Um, her spin doctors are also going to hope we're, we're lazy idiots. And they're gonna, we're going to drink from the fountain of that toxic right-wing Kool-Aid that the papers are going to spew out. Well, why? So why gonna... I mean, this is fascinating to me. I sort of touched on it with the last caller. Why does this not feel huge in a way that I'm pretty sure it would have done at previous points in British politics? OK, well, Gordon Brown was caught on tape as a different yes. situation. He was a socialist, an exceptionally clever man with morals and standards, all of which were anathema to the Daily Mail. Yes. Liz Truss is a sail flapping in the wind. She gets filled with hot air from the prevailing winds of political trope. She tacks around without course to sail, content that at the end of the day she's sinking less quickly than the HMS Rishi Sunak. Unfortunately I, I, for UK PLC, we're sailing on the bloody tide. No, I, need, I, I, need, I need a slightly less well-rehearsed line on, on why, because politicians have been... But Andrew Mitchell was a Conservative MP and the Daily Mail yeah. liked him. He called a police officer a pleb. The wheels fell off his cabinet career. What, what's happened to politics or to the country to create an air that Liz Truss is just going to waltz away from this? Because the rise of social media, the impact of social media, and the oh. uh, the ability and the ability of social media and uh, online media to manipulate people's thoughts and to persuade you're more, them. You're more pessimistic than I am, you know. I I, I mean, I'm pretty. I, sp- I know you are, and that's quite an achievement. I'm quite big on on the manipulation of people and and the grooming and the gaslighting of the nation. And few people are more caustic in their evidence based criticism of the uh, absurd Daily Mail than me. But I I, I, I disagree. I, I think something odd is happening temporarily um, rather than rather than permanently and, and I think people will go back to being outraged by political candidates who call them lazy but just I guess I'm going down my own rabbit hole now I, I think that until the lies of Brexit have been completely highlighted and admitted then you're never going to have honesty or truth mattering in British politics anymore it's, it's not Boris Johnson you get rid of Boris Johnson you just get rid of one liar arguably the best liar of them all you don't get rid of an environment in which lies are allowed to flourish and, and are professionally um, advantageous. Right, I'm going to try it now. I, I'm going to try my forensic analysis of Liz Truss and recent pronouncements. So we'll begin with the full clip of what she said yesterday. Basically, British British workers, I want to read a book about this, which got mischaracterized. 
if British workers um, produce less per hour, then, and that's a combination of kind of skill and application. Essentially, it's partly a sort of mindset and attitude thing. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's working culture, basically. If you go to China, it's quite different, I can assure you. But there's a fundamental issue of British working culture. And essentially, if we're going to be a richer country and a more prosperous country, that needs to change. But I don't think people are that keen to change that. There's a slight thing in Britain about wanting the easy answers. In the referendum, it's like, we say it's all Europe that's causing us all these problems. It's all these migrants that are causing these problems. And actually, what needs to happen is, you know, a bit more, uh, yeah. more graft. <laughs> and it's, it's not a popular message. So that, that was leaked yesterday. It comes from 2019, three years after the referendum. That is Liz Truss saying on the... Well, it is on the record, I suppose, not that she knew it was going to be on the record when she said it, that the use of Europe and migration during the referendum were completely dishonest tactics, were false answers to the question of how do we improve the country. That should be incredible, right? Regardless of whether you're 52, 48, even if you've got a scarf tied so tightly around your neck that it's cut off the flow of blood to your head, that should be incredible. As a woman who is campaigning to become the second Brexit Prime Minister, so I don't think Theresa May fits into that category, even though Trust voted Remain, she's become more Brexity than Rishi Sunak, who voted Leave. There she is admitting that the whole flipping hill of beans was built upon lies about Europe and migration. I don't know how that makes you feel as someone who voted for it because of Europe and migration. But she thinks you're really, really stupid. I guess in your case, she's right. But she thinks you're really, really lazy as well, which I don't believe you are. So that, that's what she thinks. OK, that's what she thinks. In fact, listen to that bit again. Crucially, the bit at the end is, is quite important. There's a slight thing in Britain about wanting the easy answers. In the referendum, it's like, we say it's all Europe that's causing us all these problems. So it's migrants that yeah. cause these problems, and actually, what needs to happen is, to me, a bit more, uh, yeah. more graft. <laughs> and it's, it's not a problem. That's actually. incredible. Europe and migrants. Europe and migrants. Wow. Um, okay. During one of these interminable hustings or debates, uh, Chris Mason of the BBC put to her the, the, the line that I've been hitting you over the head with for the best part of a decade. And and, and I want you to listen to this. It's incredible. I want you to notice two things. I want you to notice how easily she lies, how easily she tries to disown the opinion that we know she holds, because I've just played you a recording of her articulating it. I also want you to notice what's happened to her voice in the last three years. Let's trust on your idea of changing the economic orthodoxy. You have talked about this for many years. In fact, you co-wrote a book the best part of 10 years ago that set out some of these arguments. In that book, though, you and your fellow authors talked about, well, our audience here in the room tonight and at home watching and listening as amongst the worst idlers in the world. We work among the lowest hours, we retire early, our productivity is poor. Is that what you're saying to the people who you aspire that, to That's not what I'm saying. And, um, I, I in use a book you wrote. On the, well, it, every author wrote a different chapter and I wrote the chapter on education. That particular chapter was written by Dominic Raab, who's actually supporting, uh, supporting Rishi's campaign. Uh, so you, but you just, <laughs> just, 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 to be, just to be absolutely clear. So she's lying about her own beliefs. She's throwing a colleague dishonestly under a bus and she is inflicting further division upon the party that she seeks to lead. And remember, whichever politician you look at, whichever leader you look at, look at how they handle the party and you'll get an idea of how they would handle a country. Whether you're talking about Jeremy Corbyn or Boris Johnson, look at how they handle a party. If they can run a party, they can run a country. If they can't run a party, they can't. Look, that's how she will treat the country. And listen now to this a little bit later in the same debate. So you remember what she said about how Europe was used as a false... Uh, alarm, really, to explain problems in the country. Now listen to Liz Truss, the same Liz Truss, although I grant you nothing like the same voice, the same Liz Truss three years later. The Liz Truss there recorded in 2019 admitting that Europe is used as a false, a false sort of promise, a false uh, deliverer, if you like, of, of reasons why the country is not in a better state. And now listen to her just just a couple of weeks ago. What what Britannia Unchained was about, it was about a belief that Britain could have a better future and that we didn't just need to simply accept the orthodoxy, the way things have always been done, the bean counting of saying, you know, we have to just 
except that nothing will ever change. I believe we can do things differently. I want to change our regulations. I want to get those EU regulations off the statute book. The front of the woman. So privately, she knows that talking gibberish about Europe is a very good way of offering up false hope that the country can be improved. Privately, she's on tape saying it. Publicly, she's still doing it. It's 11 o'clock. It's four minutes after 11. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we change tack now completely. I'm, I'm not going to labour the point or bore you with it daily, but I am conscious of talking together about things that are not going to add to the growing sense of, of, of doom and gloom around the country. You can't really talk about the uh, proper news without... Uh, having a bit of a shiver, whether it is energy bills or inflation or cost of living or um, uh, labour shortages and, and business closures. But you can't do it every day and undiluted because it, it's, well, it's bad for us both, actually. It's bad for both of us. And I like stories that allow us to go off in completely different directions. Uh, in fact, I like them more than ever at the moment. It, for example, yesterday's conversation about lonely men I thought was really, really fascinating, really interesting. I could have carried it on and no doubt will return to it. But a bit of a different one for you now. Because th there is a, a sense, I talked about it yesterday, didn't I, with Socrates and Thucydides. I often, I often cite Socrates and Thucydides when I'm talking about uh, popular culture. Um, there is a sense that the young people are different from what we are. That you always have this. When I started doing this job, you may find this hard to believe, I still felt young in the sense of when we were talking about video games or, or films or cultural change, I was part of the zeitgeist that was creating the culture and creating the cultural change. Do you, you, you see what I mean? Especially with video games. One of my uh, finest Fleet Street achievements was to smuggle a five-star review for Grand Theft Auto 3 into the Daily Mail. Uh, just two or three days before, I don't think anyone read the video game reviews when I used to write the video game reviews. for. The, I mean, anyone in, in charge, anyone in power. Uh, I've, I've been literally less than a week later, they were running a full-page editorial about how it was the end of civilization as we know it, and I'd managed just to sneak in a little uh, um, uh, five-star review for, for one of the best video games ever made. So do you see what I mean? I, 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 the, 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 the idea of it being the younger generation. Um, well, I'm not anymore. And I'm very conscious of that. I read stories about things like this, and I am, and I'm not at the top end of the age range, but I'm certainly not at the bottom. So it's about television. Young people now watch almost seven times less broadcast television than people aged over 65. And, and I think the key phrase is broadcast television, because technically TikTok is telly. Technically, it's a, a screen with moving images on it. We take that as what we mean by television. Broadcast television will mean programs that have been made for television, if you like. So that would include Netflix and Amazon Prime and all the rest of the streaming platforms. Linear television, I'm quite good at this, linear television is... And, you know, I, I first heard that phrase. Have I told you this? And the BBC's media editor, Amol Rajan, uh, told, used the phrase at a, at a book festival. I was having a chat with him backstage at a book festival. I had no idea what he was talking about. And I, I thought, I can't tell him I don't know what he's talking about. There's quite a few, large number of TV people in the, in the group, and he, he just drops it into the middle of the conversation casually. Everyone else knows what it means. They're all stroking their beards and nodding their heads. Um, and I just I thought, what, what could it be? I think I, I thought I'd worked it out by the end of the conversation. It's fair to say I didn't make many meaningful contributions to the conversation, but I know what linear television is now. Linear television is, is what we think of as the telly. For people of my generation, it's, it's scheduled programming. So the 10 o'clock news at 10 o'clock on BBC One. Uh, EastEnders, half past seven, BBC One. So that's linear television, television where you, but you, you pay for the paper you get the schedule out and you can only watch it once it's been on in many ways that's that's kind of withering on the vine isn't it so broadcast television is a more useful thing because you bbc now you go to the iplayer and you can watch pretty much whatever you want whenever you want as long as it's already been broadcast i don't know how many of us actually watch it apart from the news and the soaps actually watch it at the point the moment of broadcast so that's uh 
So that's just changed. One in five UK homes has access to all three of the biggest streaming services. I think we can be fairly confident that that's going to be coming down as the cost of living crisis bites. But right now, one in five, 20% of homes have Netflix, Disney Plus and Amazon Prime. That's about 300 quid a year, although there are an awful lot of deals, freebies and introductory offers in place. Um there you go. Yeah, the, the the number of households subscribing to at least one streaming service has actually come down by three hundred and fifty thousand. So the pressure on household budgets already beginning to bite there. And I wasn't sure this was a topic um, until until I thought of my late dad and those magical moments as a family when you, as a child first felt the stirrings of your adult sense of humour, for example, when you first got jokes that made your dad laugh or made your mum laugh. I think for most people my generation, you'd be thinking Morecambe and Wise, probably. Not that it was particularly adult or, 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 or mature humour, especially Eric's sort of slapstick, but laughing. I could, do, you not, do you remember hearing your dad laugh when you were up in bed? When you were in bed? Uh, and supposed to be nodding off and there'd be a program that just made your dad roar. Dave Allen for my old man. He'd just he'd listen to Dave Allen until the tears were pouring down his face. And Only Fools and Horses, surely, for, for many generations, not just mine. A program that we would all watch. My, I've got a, my sister is two years younger than me. But all four of us would watch Only Fools and Horses. And the Christmas special was an event. It was part of, it was as much a part of Christmas as the cake. The Only Fools and Horses Christmas special. And that's when I wondered whether actually this isn't just another example of old people thinking that young people are, are, are profoundly different and that meaningful change is underway. That, that this might actually be one of those stopped clock stories where something quite significant is happening in the world of culture and in the world of um, entertainment. Because with a couple of exceptions, and I listen not to put too fine a point on it, or indeed not to prove Liz Truss's point. I, I had square eyes growing up. I, I, I could watch telly even when there were only four channels, three channels. I remember when Channel 4 launched, it was really exciting. Even when there were only three channels, I could watch telly. I, I just, that, like, like I, the only person I think I've ever spoken to who made me feel like I hadn't watched enough telly as a child was Richard Osman, who just was permanently, and look what it's done for him career-wise. I love the idea of someone saying, no, you're never going to get anywhere watching so much telly, Osman. And now he's one of the most brilliant TV geniuses in the, in the, history, of, in the history of the medium. Um, but I watched a lot of telly. So I like telly. I like telly probably more than even now than anyone else in my family. And perhaps that's the reason why we have happened upon a few things that we do all watch together. And I'm never happier than when all four of us are sat in the sitting room watching the same thing on telly, like loving something that we all watch together. Uh, Death in Paradise is a huge, huge one in our house. All four of us absolutely love Death in Paradise. It helps that Ralph is a pal of mine, so occasionally he'll record a little message for the girls and they'll get really excited about it and we'll all sit down and watch it and then they, they'll go back and watch the old ones. Midsummer Murders, again. Um, with the brilliant Neil Dudgeon now taking over from John Nettles. We'll watch, we'll watch Midsummer Murders as, as a family, as all four of us. But when I was growing up, that was every night. Every night we'd all be sitting in front of the same telly watching the same programmes. Every night. And there'd be little rows about it. As I got a little older, maybe I'd nip upstairs and play on my Spectrum because I didn't want to watch the news again. My father was a journalist, so the news, we'd watch the six, the nine and the ten growing up, which was not ideal. Um, sports, whatever it was, sitting around, all, all four of us, watching the same programmes on television. And the question is, does it matter that we're not going to be doing that anymore? We, well, I'll tell you what we love. What's the um, Alice Osman thing that's just been huge? What was it, what's it called? The Alice Osman thing. That's just, oh, come on. What's my back? Heartstopper. Heartstopper, that, that all four, that's very modern, that's very much their zeitgeist. But Mrs O'Brien and I absolutely loved that. But this must mean, these numbers must mean, that families don't watch TV anymore. And I think that's sad. What I don't know is whether or not it's significant. And that's the question I've got for you. Do you think this is actually quite a serious moment in family life, in family history? 03456060. 
seven three. That does it actually. Now that I've painted this rather poignant picture of little me being kept away by my dear old dad's guffawing when uh, Morecambe and Wise or Dave Allen were on the telly and the family all sitting around watching the trotters, I think there's something really sad going on here. I think it's a real shame, and I don't think it's temporary, and I don't think it's reversible. I think that the days... Just think of the royal family. God, Ralph Little's getting a lot of mentions on the show today, isn't he? Just think of the royal family. That may not have been a crystal clear reflection of your own domestic setup, but I bet, whatever your class, I bet there were some echoes there of your own family, weren't there? That's gone forever. Oh, I just had a little shiver then. I think this is really sad. I kind of want you to persuade me that it isn't. And if you'd like to try, the number you need is 0345 606 0973. If you want to tell me to give my head a wobble and get with the programme, you are particularly encouraged to do so today. Or, of course, if you want to join me in, in actually mourning the passing of the days when families would watch television together. And you know how this programme works. We're always far too clever for our own good. So I, I want to know why it matters. Why does it matter? What are we going to lose now that we no longer watch television together? 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. And, and tempting though it would be to say, oh no, it hasn't changed at all. All we do now is watch streaming together. 16 to 24 year olds spend 53 minutes watching TV each day. That's gone down by two thirds in 10 years. Over 65s spend just under six hours on average watching TV daily. So I'm afraid it is just change. And I think it's sad change and I think we'll lose something. But I want your help in either backing away from that conclusion or identifying exactly what it is that we're going to lose. 03456060973. Oh, and do you know what I missed as well? The whole thing about the whole country watching something together. So the most popular programme in the first six months of this year was the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Death in Paradise makes the top ten, as indeed does uh, the, I always call it the cook, the thief, his wife and her canoe. It's, it's the, 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 the thing Eddie did, Eddie Marson did about John Darwin, about the canoe, the, the, the fella who, who, who ran away and pretended he died. Um, it's like a roll call of full disclosure guests, the top ten of television uh, in this country in the first six months. But the stuff that the whole country watched, that doesn't really happen anymore either, does it? I just think we're going to lose something and, and I'm equally conscious of just being the old git. <laughs>